If this is your first time listening to our podcast, welcome. Our programming brings a diversity of voices connected to Myanmar to share their perspectives, thoughts, and reflections about what has been happening there since the military coup in 2021. All of our guests share one thing in common, a deep personal stake in the ongoing crisis. And it is an honor for us to be able to bring their voices into your earbuds. But however difficult it may be to hear some of their stories, we hope that you will come away with a deeper and more nuanced understanding of what is happening there. everyone. Uh, my name is Unanda, and I am excited to introduce you guys to, of course, a really awesome recipe. I'm sure most people are totally familiar with it. Either you have been um, privileged enough to enjoy that at home, hopefully made by your grandma, mom, or just, just an overall auntie <laughs> that have made it for you, or perhaps you enjoyed it in the streets, uh, with, um, you know, in, in one of the markets or perhaps even one of the monastery festivals. Um, you know, it's one of the core staple dishes to our entire community. And it's one that I'm sure you are already thinking about in your mind. It is. Mohinga, <laughs> the ultimate dish. Um, I honestly can eat this breakfast, lunch, dinner, anytime really. And, you know, it is traditionally made for breakfast. I'm sure most of you guys are um, totally aware about it, but I wanted to kind of just walk through it and share with you if this is something you've heard of, but maybe are curious to maybe seeing if you can make it at home or yeah, uh, just, just being curious and, and checking it out. Um, so mohinga overall is a vermicelli rice noodle uh, fish soup, and because Burma itself is so, it's surrounded by water, and of course the main river that goes through Erdogan, uh River, it's a lot of seafood. Um, seafood's really our main protein, right? So this seafood, uh, I'm sorry, this <laughs> fish soup overall is super, super important and a staple for us. Um, it's also using very common ingredients that's very humble and cost efficient. The most expensive thing on this ingredient list is going to be the fish. Uh, there are two types of mohinga. Uh, there is, of course, the classic traditional mohinga, which is going to be using more of a river uh, caught fish. Uh, mainly catfish is usually the most common. Or if you're going to check out the other version, which is the rakeen um, state mohinga, that is going to be more of a spicier, more brothy version. But they're essentially very similar. But the rakeen mohinga, they are on the western coast. So their fish base is going to be uh, ocean caught fish. So such a snapper, uh, that's going to be very common. So there are two versions, very similar, just the fish and the spice level is going to be different and one's broth here than the other. So you get to totally mix between the two based on what type of fresh fish is near you. Um, but essentially the main ingredients is going to be rice from a chili. You can choose either catfish or snapper since those are mainly the, um, the common fish that I personally use and is mainly found also in all of our traditional dishes. Uh, of course, you got to have your onion, garlic, lemongrass, turmeric, uh, smoked paprika, and you can choose the thickener, also known as, you know, a roux. Either you can have it as a toasted rice powder, or you can do a toasted besin uh, flour, which is the chickpea flour. So either choice of those. I personally use the chickpea flour because I think it's a nice nuttier taste to it, but you can choose between the two. 
Uh, you got to have your boiled egg, uh, shallot bulbs, fish sauce, and shrimp paste. So these are really like the core ingredients, and it's really commonly found in most of our kitchen, especially if you are an Asian cuisine fanatic such as myself. These are common things to have. So that's really all the main ingredients that you need. So really, now you have your main broth right there, nice and simmering on low. Um, it's going to smell amazing. And while it's starting to simmer, this is when you can go ahead and add a, um, the shallot bulbs. They are my personal favorite. When you throw them in there in the broth, not only is it going to soak up all that deliciousness, but it becomes so tender. So when you eat it, it's like it kind of like pops in your mouth if especially if you have the small to medium shallot bulbs it like pops and all the all the all the um broth just comes right out so you want to throw a good amount of those into the soup while it's still simmering and for extra bonus points if you have access to a banana tree my goodness you are so lucky uh <laughs> go ahead and if you want to make it super authentic if you can have access to this banana tree what you want to do is get the trunk of the banana tree and you do you know the outer layers are going to be tougher right it's going to be like uh, it's in a harsher condition so you want to peel the very outside parts away until you get more into the center of the tree trunk um, essentially like a heart of the banana tree so in the in the middle it's a lot more tender or also you know in, in our burmese term nude uh, so it's going to be very very tender in the middle and you can slice that up uh, we normally have it like a uh, very thinly sliced, but you can cut it however you like, but I like the long slices. And at this point, when you throw in the shallot bulbs into the um, into the soup, you can also put in your banana uh, tree, uh, tree um, pieces, <laughs> slices in there, let it slow cook, really allow it to get even more tender in there. And there you go. You got this beautiful, delicious broth. And while that's going on, the best time to serve this as well as nice and hot. So if you are ready to serve it right here, go for it. If you're somehow have your self-control to wait to serve it another day, you can totally chill it and refrigerate it for later on. But if you're gonna eat it right away, which I think I would do, let's make sure we have our vermicelli already cooked. Um, you can either uh, cook the, uh, the, the noodles in advance with a little bit of oil added in there so that they don't stick too much in advance. So once you have your noodles, you have your beautiful broth. We got to talk about toppings too, right? That's our third thing on the side. When it comes to toppings, um, this is where you can get crazy. Make it creative as much as you like. Everybody likes different buildup to their plate. You can make it super acidic. You can make it even more um, umami with your fish uh, sauce. You can add more of that. You can add more lime. You can add cilantro. So it's going to be like a little topping platter on the side of all of those ingredients along with our boiled egg. And the egg, it's up to you. I personally like to just have it sliced in half and chopped open. It's its just beautiful to see the yolk. I think it's always nice to see it when it's slightly like, not hard, too hard boiled, but like it's still um, semi soft for the yolk. I think it tastes so good. Uh, so you're gonna have your eggs, you have your cilantro, you have your lime, you have roasted chili flakes, um, and you can also have chickpea uh, fritter crackers on the side. This is something, it's optional. I don't think it will be a traditional mohinga without it because that's such a fun nutty crunch that it's going to add. So if you are planning to make those crackers, essentially what you're doing is you will get like a... Um, like the dry split pea um, beans or the uh, or the chickpea beans, you want to make sure you soak them overnight. But once they're soaked, uh, when you're ready to make them into little fritter crackers, you get rice flour. Make sure you season it with some salt, a little turmeric, and you fry them so they become these like large flat. Uh, crunchy pieces and it does take a little while so maybe this is something you want to prep in advance um, I would recommend it otherwise your mohinga is going to get cold so <laughs> if you want to add these fritters they're great some people have uh, substituted for wonton strips it's totally up to you but um, 
uh, if you want to pay the full respect to doing a traditional route, let's go for it. <laughs> so that would be our, uh, our little topping platter. So when you dress it up, you're going to put your vermicelli rice in your bowl, ladle the, the soup or the broth that you've made um, all over it. And now you can build it by adding all of your toppings. So and essentially, when you look at this build mohinga bowl, you notice you're going to have the acidity you have heat from the chili. There's so many different textures of freshness and fried and soft and crunchiness. You have the umami from the egg and the fish sauce and the colors. Um, majority of it is going to be this beautiful yellow and green, but this yellow is almost like a golden yellow, which is, you know, it's, it's ironic, I guess, because Yamar or Burma is definitely known as the golden land, right? With all of our beautiful golden pagodas. So the colors really represent it well. And I think that's also why we have officially said, you know, this is our national dish of Yamar, which I'm totally proud to say that it is. It's so good. And I really, really hope you get a chance to, um, to enjoy this at some point. And if you have not had it in a long time, make sure you you make it for yourself. Why not share with your friends and family? <laughs> mm, thanks for that. And I think we probably should have had a <laughs> bit of a trigger warning for guests who are listening on an empty stomach because this is uh -oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely going to be floating in their mind and then stomachs, but hopefully motivate them to uh, to take it on. So yeah, Mohinga is really the, the national dish of Myanmar. It's like you know, what hamburgers are to the U.S. or sushi is to Japan or something like that. And so to talk to you, a Burmese diaspora in the United States, when you hear of Mohinga or think of Mohinga, what, what is it that comes to mind? What is it that represents to you or what memories come up or what place does it hold in, in, in your heart when you think of Mohinga? Um, when I think of Mohinga, I, it takes me back to, of course, um, when I was little, I originally grew up and was born in Yangon. So there, you know, it's like the main big city, but my grandparents from my mom's side, they originally came from like one of the um, further out villages and they had the opportunity to go to the bigger city, which is Yangon, which was the capital. And when they went to Yangon, uh, my grandfather, he was very um, involved in like the bookkeeping aspect of the um, contributions made to all the monasteries and he spoke English pretty well. So he would, you know, he had a job there right away. My grandmother, she had, um, she was mainly raising the children. They have four children, and uh, my mom is actually the baby. <laughs> Ironically, I am also the baby <laughs> of our family. So my mom being the baby, and um, you know, my grandma just kind of holding it down. She was such an amazing cook, and what she did was not only you know she fed the family, but on um, on the mornings, she was also involved in the markets. So in the markets in the morning, like not only her children are helping her with the sales and making sure, you know, they're they're helping out with the dish ups of the of the samosas or, you know, the nanjito, which um, all the different adults, which means salad um, or like the cow suez, all of these dishes are always up and all the locals came for her, for sure. <laughs> but the number one dish that everyone knew her for, and it always sold out, can you guess what it might have been? <laughs> Mohinga? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wild guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was Mohinga. And, you know, this, um, you know, for me to even, like, learn back a little more of our um, family history, it hasn't actually been brought to my attention until, like, within the last two years, which blew my mind because I've always – had a feeling for like cooking and it's just it's just fun to do it's like you know it's my creativity let uh, outlet because you, I just, why, you have to have something like that and it's something that people come over and enjoy and you can share stories about so when I heard about this or when I finally learned about it it's just it blew my mind that like you know, it's, it's kind of like in our blood, <laughs> you mm. know, to like serve it up and, you know, just feeding the community. Like it, it, it's, it kind of like rectified that I'm on the right path even more. Mm. So mm. Mohinga has a very special place in my heart for sure. And I always make it extra spicy. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm, that's great. Well, if I can tell one of my most unique Mohinga stories, which I think probably stands out from um, from what anyone else has had an experience like this. I um, So I spent, I, I've, uh, as listeners to this know, I lived in Myanmar about 15 years. I was, um, I, I went through different stages of my time there and I had a monastery stage where for several years I was living mostly in monasteries and, and, and engaged in practice at the time and was really, um, in my time in monasteries, I was really quite removed from the, the, the worldly aspect of, of life, not just of America and what was going on here with, you know, politics and worldly mm-hmm. issues and everything else, but also in Myanmar. And I had been actually before that, I'd been with the U.S. Embassy. And so I was very much involved in things on the ground in Yangon and really left that all behind for some years to, to just want to learn about monastic life. So setting the mm-hmm. context, because for the story that follows, I was just very much removed from really caring or thinking about things beyond what I wanted to learn about the monastery. And it so happened that sometime in it would have been January or February 2015, I was in Yangon for something. And um, somehow I found out that the next morning was the American Super Bowl. And uh, <laughs> even though I had like not been following sports for years and years, yeah. I always had this kind of like funny thing where like, if I was somewhere in the world where I had the chance to watch the Super Bowl, I should watch it no matter what. It was almost like, I don't know, it was just, it was, it was actually a cultural thing to me. It was just kind of like connecting back to my childhood and just remembering like what it's like to watch like the big game. And so <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't like kind of go out of my way to, but if it was just easy to do, I would always do it. So I was, um, so I was like, oh man, I, I just, I have to do this. I have to find a way to watch this. I was in Yangon. And so I, I, I found out it was starting at like five in the morning or something. And I found a sports bar in downtown Yangon that was showing it. And, you know, mind you, I'm, I haven't drank in I don't know how many decades um, following the Buddhist precepts and not just not drinking. I haven't really even been around those kind of atmospheres or environments mm-hmm. just being in monasteries. But I'm like, OK, I'm going to wake up at five in the morning and I'm going to go to the sports bar with a bunch of other Americans and presumably and like watch Seattle against Denver. And I get there and I'm just complete and I'm wearing a lung G because that's like not to make a statement, but that's like <laughs> yeah. the only thing I have. Like, that's just that's what I'm wearing at Monster. Like, I don't have anything else at that time. So I walk in a, a, an American wearing a lung G, which like immediately seems to, you know, seems like it's making a kind of statement that I'm not and immediately like super uncomfortable around a bunch of American sports fans. And in the corner of the bar, I find, I, I see, I, I, I mean, I should mention, I'm kind of freaking out because I'm just like, I have not been in this environment for so long. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to sit. I don't know any protocols. And I, I think my eyes are deceiving me, but I swear to God, in the corner of the bar, I see this monk and I'm like, I'm just like tripping out. There is no way I'm seeing a monk in the corner of this bar, sports right. bar in the morning. <laughs> And I I stare at him, like I stand in front of him, I stare, I walk away, I stand in front, I stare. And finally, like, like I hear him say, Joa, why don't you come over? And it's like, okay, my eyes aren't deceiving me because I was literally like freaking out that like, I didn't know what to do. And so I sit down and it, it, sure enough, it's this monk from Washington state um, who I had met at a monastery some months ago and he had gotten permission from his Sayada to go to the same sports bar at five in the morning to watch his Seattle Seahawks in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and so I'm just like, oh my God, I am so grateful you were here. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And so I sit down with him and for anyone who knows the Seattle, Denver, uh, and I should mention I relocated to Colorado. So I was, I had a rooting interest in Denver. For anyone who knows how that Super Bowl turned out, Seattle just destroyed Denver within a couple of minutes. And so it was like three hours of basically the game was over. <laughs> and while we're both watching the Super Bowl, we have basically a three hour conversation about meditation and Buddhism and, and other things. So it was like just one of the most unique experiences of, of that. But where the Mohinga fits in is that at halftime, I, I step out of the bar to, to get a, uh, cause I had it for some, whatever reason, I hadn't gotten anything there. It was all American food and walk next door to a Burmese cafe. I mean, obviously all, all the cafes are Burmese. I mean, we're in Yangon. So I, it's like a typical, <laughs> you know, just typical eatery. And I sit down and order a Mohinga and I'm, um, and I should also mention I'm vegetarian. And so I, uh, knew about there, there's only like a few places in downtown Yangon that actually serve Mohinga with a vegetarian broth. It would, it, oh. friends had pointed that out to me. So I, I knew those locations, you know, I would, I would go to yeah. them whenever I was around. So I went to one of those places, got a, um, a, a, uh, vegetarian Mohinga. And it was just one of the most surreal experiences because it was like, you know, I'm in this like dark, um, uh, sports American style sports bar at five in the morning with a bunch of like American fans just going crazy with 
um, uh, cheering for football, having walked out of years in the monastery to just have this little experience <laughs> and, and completely like, uh, what's the word? Just, um, like, I don't know where I am almost, you know, I'm, I'm, I walk You're out like of that reverse culture shock, exactly. yeah, like but reverse, like... <laughs> reverse, reverse culture shock. Yeah. yeah. So I <laughs> that air conditioned, super American experience <laughs> to sit down and like the heat and humidity and bustling sounds and noises and, and, and smells of Yangon to eat like the most typical meal there is with like the most typical Burmese experience and then walk back in and finish the game. And Super so that cool. was like <laughs> that juxtaposition of cultures was al always something that like stood out and cracked me up. So that's my, oh my story. goodness. Wow. That is wild. Uh, yeah. You're like, Okay, I don't think I, I can. I don't, I don't think I need wings or all that stuff that the Super Bowl <laughs> usually spare. But that's, wow, what a great story! It's not usually Mohinga's not usually your typical Super Bowl stack time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but you know what? It's not as messy as wings and all that. So I feel like mm. you know, there's a possibility. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's great. So going back into Burmese food, staying on that, moving from Mohinga, um, mm -hmm. before we go into what you're doing with Burmese food in America and also how Burmese food relates to the wider culture and such, just to understand what Burmese food is. And I know that's a really complicated question. It can go in many, many different mm -hmm. directions. There's so many ethnicities. There's Chinese and Indian influences. And, right. uh, and there's not just one thing, even as you pointed out, even the Mohinga you get in Yangon versus Mandalay versus Rakhine is going to be different. But as yeah. we talked about before the interview, there is a general misunderstanding about uh, what constitutes Burmese food. It's often kind of clumped together with its neighbors, just as there's often confusion about other things related to Myanmar. And one of the points of this podcast is to want to uh, understand those in more nuanced and detailed ways with people who know that. So I'm sure that as someone who's involved in, in Burmese food, you get a lot of questions. What is Burmese food? Tell me what, what, what defines it? What, what is it actually? And so um, how would you, what kind of general overview would you give for that? You know, uh, you're, I totally understand why everyone gets such a mix array of descriptions when it comes to Burmese food, because like you said, you know, we really have such a high influence on all of our neighbors, you know, like you said, a lot of Chinese influence, there's a lot of Indian food in, um, influence, Thai for sure, we were talking about coconut <laughs> milk and things, it's like, no, I mean, we love our coconut, definitely, mm. but it's not in too many things, um, like entree dishes, desserts, however, lots of coconut definitely that's like mm. our main like sweet um treat definitely um so it is such a broad way to describe burmese food because it's such a fusion of southeast asia um of course there's you know the core things that does make um the dish not really too influenced by any of our neighboring countries such as mohinga or like lapet, which is the fermented tea leaf salad. Um, those type of things do make it just be us. So when it comes to an overall, bur like what makes Burmese food Burmese food, I think what makes it so beautiful is that we have like that adapt adaptability to kind of just invite um, people or like different tastes and, and, and culture. And we'll, we'll like mix it up a little bit based on what is our local, um, lo locally available, you know, um, uh, goods. Like, our, you know, if, if it's going to be um, a mainly vegetarian base, which is going to be coming from in, uh, Indian cuisine, we may add certain things because it's so locally sourced next to us for like seafood or, or, or you know, specifically chamao, which is like a sour leaf, um, sour leaf um, vegetable or water grass um, spinach. So it's, it, you know, it is still a hard one for me to answer when people ask me, honestly, I kind of am like, well, have you, what kind of food do you like? And if you honestly like, you know, just Asian food in general is such a beautiful harmony where we, we like really allow the balance to shine in all different parts that have such an influence for us, you know? So yeah, it's, it's still a hard one to answer, honestly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really think, is. you know, certainly, like, as you mentioned, the um, mohinga and um, the, the pickled tea leaf, pet, those are uh -huh. the petho, right? Those are, those definitely get a lot of attention to being unique. But for me, the truly unique part of Burmese cooking that I love and haven't found, like, 
any parallel in any other cuisine I've had, even even in terms of influences, is the salads or a thot. I mean, the yes. salads are just <laughs> incredible. You could just go on with like the pennyworth salad and the green tomato salad and the ginger salad and just and the, the use of shallots of the shouty thot. You know, I don't yeah. I don't know how you translate that the shouty thot, but like and that's something mm-hmm. you know that's a fruit you can only you you can't get easily in other places. But just the combination of textures and sweet and sour and crunchy and everything, the salads are are just really a defining aspect. And that's really why I I went ahead and you know um, and, and and you know started at Thole because uh, a though it's it's such to me like it's such a humbling um, concept because it's almost like you know if, if when you're in college you're broke and you're just like I have nothing to eat and you just like look mm. in the fridge and you kind of like oh let me just put this on that and oh it's mm. pretty good so mm. when it comes to it though you know uh, we're pretty um pro- we're a poverty uh country obviously and you know we do, we just don't get a lot of protein source and things like that so uh the adaptability of adding our proteins from a lot of the chickpea flowers and beans and nuts you know that that really comes into like the texture and the umami feel to all the variety of thoughts you know a lot of a lot of our dishes are vegetable based because once again it's just cheaper than having protein so when it comes to it though like it's such a mass variety that you can take it um the main i i personally think the main goals which you pretty much said on most of the thoughts are going to feature and i've said it on mohinga and i think that's really the ultimate goal for any dish that i whenever i eat something i'm looking for is it going to have the acid is it going to have a heat the texture, umami, and the colors, right? The presentation. And every mm. atho is going to hit you with that. Yeah, and it yeah, balances, yeah. right? You're going to have mm. some sweet, but then they put salt in it and yep. sour to really just harmonize everything. So, mm. and it's, you would think you're just back to zero because you balance, it like cancels out. It doesn't cancel out. It's just like mm. builds it more into one form. So yeah, atho is just it's so fun to me. My mom honestly makes the best atho's all the time. Like whatever mm. is in the fridge, she's like, she just whips mm-hmm. up something and i'm like what kind of thought is this and she's <laughs> like oh it's just a rice a thought like she'll say tomato which is rice a thought but it's mm. like different every time because it's based on what we have and and she'll make sure she hit all those elements you know it's just like oh okay <laughs> mm, that's great and you 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 mentioned something about just the the some poverty that exists in myanmar and i think that connects to this is kind of a good segue to looking at how food is related to culture and economy and governance and, and all those things that aren't readily apparent. There was a, mm-hmm. a quote that stood out to me that I read uh, last year by the, uh, he, he's a Thai-based travel writer named Joe Cummings and travels, uh, writes a lot about Thailand, but also about neighboring countries. And he was asked about Burmese food and said something that was so obvious, and yet I'd never considered it in all my time there. He was his answer about why Burmese food wasn't better known in the world was that um, because of the poverty that so many people live under there, which of course is a, a direct correlation with the terrible military regime that's been in power for so many of these years, that mm-hmm. there is that most families just simply don't have the money to buy um, uh, to to cook with better quality ingredients, like just simply the rice or the cooking oil or the sauces mm-hmm. or whatever else. And so because of the poverty with which people have to find a way to cook with and to eat, the the quality of the overall cooking is uh, is less because of that. And he's making the argument that if you know if um, that that if you have the chance to eat Burmese food in Myanmar with uh, at a at a middle class or higher home, that the taste is really very different. Yeah, um, definitely a correlation between the two. You know, it's I, I think. Our people are very resilient and, you know, they're, even though there's a lot of like oppression and, you know, all the struggle happening and it's like a repeating like Groundhog Day nightmare, honestly, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, you're like, oh geez, here it is again, you know, but the people are just so resilient and Mm -hmm. I'm so, yeah, I'm so proud (laughs) to Mm -hmm. definitely be Burmese as well. And it's because of what's like, we even out of all this, you know, people, they get, they get so creative and they're, they're going to make sure, you know, whatever it is that they have, like they're, they're so welcoming. They're just going to say, come over and eat. It doesn't even Mm -hmm, matter. Like, mm -hmm. even if they have like a little bit, you know, they're just like, oh, just come over and share and eat. And, you know, that really builds a lot of like, 
um, not just connection, but just a support system that's really rare, you know, just to say, come over and yeah. eat with you. Like that's, that's a huge deal, especially if, yeah. you know, if, if it's really, you know, it's really hard to put your, put food on the plate in, in certain yeah. parts of, of, of Burma for sure. So they're just really watching out for each other. And the connection of the food is just, you know, um, like their their way of being like hey i'm here for you even mm. though like politically we might not be able to talk too much about mm. this or that because i'm scared but it's like mm. you know hey we're in this together it's like that unsaid um communication line you know mm. yeah yeah absolutely and it's you know it, it, would, it would never cease to amaze me how many places i would end up spontaneously whether it was a monastery or or a friend's house or friend's family house or even acquaint even people i'd never met before <laughs> that just someone had brought me there and we happened to be there and there was always food ready and prepared there there was always something extra uh ready for to be to to be fed and and to eat and just the most random and spontaneous occasions and you know you just contrast that with american culture where if uh, if you're inviting someone for dinner, I mean, it's so much more of a formal thing of like, well, what time can you come? And okay, can can you eat this? And okay, I'll have this prepared. And okay, we have to go shopping for this. And it's just this big production. And in Burma, just time and time and time again, so many cases that you just happen to 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 be here or be invited there. Or you went this way, and there was just always food for <laughs> to serve to you and not just not just leftovers not just um i, I mean because so, another thing to say is that, that that also is how burmese food relates to the environment that it's in is that so much of it is cooked fresh because the country has had such problems with the electrical grid there wasn't mm -hmm. really uh many people couldn't store food and so um to this day you know so much of the food is just cooked freshly and i think that also feeds into the kind of monastic culture where you would if you spend time at monasteries you see how the food that's offered you know first goes to the senior monks and then yes. goes to the junior monks and the novices and the nuns and just keeps going down the line down the line and then eventually the the day laborers you know get kind of this big bowl of of whatever leftovers have been mixed together and then after they eat then it's the you know literally the dogs the crows the cats and then down to the ants and the other insects and so you just mm. see <laughs> nothing getting wasted and yet this fresh food being prepared and made every day and there was always enough of it i mean there was always i, I mean i think if someone just came over randomly to my home yeah i could probably find some leftovers <laughs> and heat something up always. or a microwave but you know that's totally different than just having and we should also say about burmese food it's not uh, it, it's it's often um, many different curries and salads and soups and other things cooked entirely separately. So yeah. you could have a platter of, you know, easily 10 different things in 10 different bowls that, that you eat <laughs> and that are served separately and enjoyed separately and, and cooked fresh every day. And I've even had instructions from Burmese of how to eat it, of how like yes. <laughs> you, know, you should have like a little bit of this soup and then you have this salad to reflect this taste. And then you have this rice to balance this out. And then you have this curry to do this, but then you have the pickle with the curry. And yep. so there's just- And they'll it's... always be, yeah, they'll always have their own bias way. And you're yeah. like, oh, okay, I'll eat it this way. And the, the person next to you is like, no, 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 no. You want to, to know, <laughs> like build it this way. And it's so it's, yeah, it's almost like every plate's never gonna be the same because yeah, you get such a spread of like all different things in the front of you. Almost, I think that's why I thought I fell in love with tapas like instantly when I found out what mm -hmm. tapas were. Because mm -hmm. I was like, oh, like perfect. Order everything, a little bit of everything. Give me a bowl of rice or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, everybody just passes a little bite of everything, making their own unique bite, you know? And each bite, you try to build it. Yeah. You, you, like you're not just going to do one scoop of everything. It's like you got to put a little tab of that pickled mango, a little bit of uh, this, you know, a little um, bit of the soup on top maybe on the rice and a little bit of the curry you gotta have that ratio it's it's really fun to like customize and have that playfulness for each bite <laughs> mm, yeah definitely and i'm really glad that you contrasted this sense of the reality of some of the poverty that's there with the extraordinary sense of generosity i think those that's really the full picture to understand and i think nowhere is that more evident than the monks alms round and i've had foreign friends western friends who've become monks and have gone on the alms round and to a person, I've never heard such consistent emotion being described as what it has felt like to be walking in silence with feelings of goodwill and mm. to be passing by very humble villages where where it's very obvious that the, the means are very low there and giving spoonfuls of rice to the monks with such a pure and generous and, and really joyous heart. And the monks, these foreign monks telling me that there, there's nothing that inspired their practice as much as when they would come back from those alms rounds and just feel 
um, mm. you know, the, the, the wealth of gratitude being given to them that they just felt compelled to practice, that their practice was, was not just for themselves and not just something they were trying to purify their own minds and find their own no. inner peace, but, but like this service of wider society that they had been invested in. And I think what, if we take more of a meditative or Buddhist angle on this part of the conversation, I think that's something that, that one by and large misses to a large extent in, in Western society is that this sense of, of all the different parts coming together and feeling really integrated and holistic and in, in, um, in not just pursuing one's own practice in one's own way, but part of something, part of a much greater whole. Yes. My, one of my, you know, my mom, def, she's very involved in the monastery and, and, and Buddhism. And I'm so, so fortunate. And I'm so thankful that she, like, since I was like, I don't know, three years old, <laughs> she'll take me to the monasteries. And it was crazy because most kids, obviously my age were like, want to play outside and stuff. And she was just be like, Oh, mm. sit down here. Like, see if you can meditate with me or, or like, I'll learn all the chants. And even to today, I still remember a good majority. And that's something I want to like, definitely reconnect even further later on. But like, mm. I'm, I'm like, I was just like, sit there as a three year old and like meditate with her <laughs> and like chant. And like the best memories were like, once again, when the food was served, the potluck, right? The full moon festivals and stuff. And you best believe you bring yourself like a little little Tupperware so you take stuff home. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my favorite things about um, Buddhism and like chanting at the end is the Thadu at the end, which is kind of like, like you're blessing back to like everything else around mm -hmm. you, you know? So it's not necessarily like, Oh, like, I hope I win the lottery. Right. I hope I, you know, this or that. It's like, no, I just, you know, I'm just all the connection and uh, what you're building through prayer and, you know, intention, you're the whole, the whole goal is to like, sh like send it out. That's, I think that's so beautiful. You know, <laughs> I'd like to literally, give it away like that's the whole point because mm. you 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 get what you give you know at the end of the day so like mm. um when it comes to food like it totally transpired to that because it's just like oh they may not have much but they're like oh here please like take it like i mm. I, I want you to enjoy it with me it's the company <laughs> Sure. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue into like we, we were talking before about the way that food in general and Burmese food specifically was a window to the people and the culture, even the type of governance. Looking now at the monastery and the role of the role of food in the monastery, the types of foods, the if there's um, specific foods for, for different events or just um, just looking in general at food at Burmese Buddhist monasteries, what comes to mind when you think about food in that context? Um, you know, I always just think of like, well, Mohinga, it's not always at every um, holiday festival, but it just feels in incomplete if it's not there. But um, there's always going to be all the curries. Um, but um, the the monks, you know, they they are obviously um, uh, they eat first, and they obviously don't eat past a certain time because they fast. Um, majority of them are vegetarians, so when we do go to these potlucks, majority of the things we do put out, we will make sure it's like vegetarian based, and it's pretty easy to do too because. Once again, protein's not something that is easily sourced, so our staple foods are already very vegetarian-based. Um, but um, a lot of um, sweets are not sweets or something. I think it's funny because you know me diving into the culinary world, and like when I was little, I would eat all of it, but I don't know what any of them are called. But I would recognize it just by looking at it and and, and whatnot. But they're all really like rice base which is which is interesting to me because rice is obviously going to be in the entree the main dish and such but then in your dessert it's like oh it's rice too but we're gonna add like sweet to it you know <laughs> so it's such a staple um but at the monasteries and at um at the um <laughs> at the um potlucks uh i do see majority is going to be a lot of the gao sui or or just different sizes of noodles different vegetable mixtures um everybody just brings uh, a dish you know that's that's what i love about it and it's never always the same so you don't see the common but i definitely have like my own favorites you know uh that i go towards but i i've honestly have not really eaten anything that i don't like <laughs> Mm, right. So let's talk about what you're doing with Burmese food in America with Athotle. Share a bit about wh what you're trying to get off the ground and what 
your version and vision of how you're trying to bring Burmese food into a new context? Yeah, so I, you know, I definitely want to respect the authenticity and the traditional route of each dish. That's, um, that's something I definitely valued number one, but I do want to see more playfulness in our community. Just, I think there's not too much heightened on creativity. It's just not something that was very, um, like introduced to us, like at very young, it's not something we promote to like early on yet, you know, of course, we're always going to have our imagination stuff, but I would, I, I always felt like the creativity part was not the number one thing that they're like all about. So when it comes to the Ole, I want to respect definitely the, the authenticity and the traditional dishes, but I wanted to have always like playful takes on them and put my own little twist. Uh, I went to when I first moved um, from Florida up here, I'm in North Carolina, Asheville now, you know, my monasteries and my Burmese communities was really back in Florida. So when I came up here, I've, I ate a lot of Thai, I ate a lot of Indian food, but you know, my mom's down in Florida, so it's just not the same. So I would call her a lot, ask her how to cook things. And as that was kind of evolving, I was just like, you know, we have a really great culinary school in my town. So I went I went and got my culinary degree and it was it was really fun because it opened my eyes to how much more of a well oiled um, machine it could be and more of on a more professional scale and more elevated um, that we could definitely take these humble uh, like dishes too. So I've always had that in the back of my mind. Oh, I could add it like this or that, you know, add a foam. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, but still have the authentic um, uh, ingredients and, and flavor profile to it. So throughout the whole culinary school, I've always had in the back of my head that like Burmese food was my main reason. So after I graduated, I really worked on all the recipes at home. I called my mom a lot. Uh, my husband never really complained about having to try all my dishes. So that was good. Uh, I was able to just like not have any waste at all. He's all about supporting and he loves it too. Mm. So I worked on all the recipes. And when it came to, um, so I graduated in 2021 of spring, and that was, of course, peak of COVID and all that. It was really intense because I was also doing full-time uh, work. But after I graduated, it took a year to really just finalize everything and realize, you know, I really want to keep continuing forward um, in, the, in the culinary world. And there's really no presence of Burmese food in the Western Carolinas at all. So... I just said, you know, let's let's just I don't know how to start this, but I'm just going to put one foot forward. And I started my Atole LLC and did my first pop up in um, May 2022. And uh, you best believe my first menu had Mohinga on there mm, <laughs> with the, yes. with the lapetto. <laughs> you have to. Mm. Uh, so I had the lapetto and then also bamo, which is like mm. a Burmese pancake pretty much with poppy yeah. seeds and, you know, coconut flakes. So I had mm. that and it sold out like immediately. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh. Maybe it was beginner's luck. So I did another pop-up, sold out. And I was like, wow, look at all these interests. And I kept doing these pop-ups just to kind of see if there's curiosity here. And Asheville is a very creative hmm. <laughs> uh, city here. And uh, the culinary scene here is so phenomenal. Like hmm. it's it's top notch. So I was just like, ooh, let me see. Um, let's, let's keep this going and seeing if this is something we can keep continuing. And, you know, since 2022 of May to now, I was able to finish up with like eight pop-ups, uh, a market and a catering. And the whole concept behind it is not only to just introduce uh, Burmese cuisine to people that had never had it, uh, but majority, which surprisingly have, uh, they shared with me so many of their travel stories. And, mm. and it was, it's so lovely to hear because, mm. you know, yeah. you, you don't, you keep thinking like, oh, no one really knows about it. And then they yeah. like, look at all these people that are probably my neighbors. And I'm <laughs> right. like, wow, like, it's really cool. That's literally my like bridge to connect to them and um, present it in more of a fun um, way and elaborative way and um, putting techniques that I've learned in culinary school to play around with it. You know, I never really want to set any rules or any boxes on anything I do. Um, so I, I really, you know, I'm just taking it and seeing where it goes. I'd like to keep continuing and doing pop-ups, but essentially the whole um, uh, vision of this is to keep going until, to keep doing pop-ups and contribute it 
towards a small brick and mortar. Mm. I would love for a small spot to not only be a strong foundation of a spot for me, but, you know, a, a spot for the community to come together. If they can, you know, not only enjoy delicious food, but it will help, uh, uh, you know, spread awareness to what's going on um, in our country and just shed some light with our resilience culture that just, mm. you know, <laughs> what are we facing now, you know? Right. And um, yeah, I just, I, I feel like this is, uh, my my way and my path to add it, helping it be added to the culinary map, you know. Mm, that's great. And so you mentioned that you have kind of a way to respect the tradition and, and where it came from, but also have a sense of creativity, playfulness in the food world that's often called fusion in and in, in doing so in a way that you found that within Burmese society is not so common. Can you give an example of a particular dish that you you went through a process of playing with and came out with something different? Yeah, so this is this is my um, first original take, and I actually did it um, in my capstone when I was back in culinary school. It was part of like our final, and I was just like, I really want to respect something that is super well known for for Burmese food, but how can I mess around with it a little bit so it looks more fun and it's a playful mm. take? So uh, lapetho, which we've talked about for um, a, a couple uh, minutes ago, which mm-hmm. is that fermented tea leaf salad. You know, uh, we mm. that one's really unique to us because no one else really eats tea leaves and um you know i love tea leaf salad (laughs) so i was like hmm let's see how i can kind of like switch it up a little bit and deliver it you know differently so normally um it isn't a thote which is a salad so it's when you toss it all together you got the the fermented tea leaf you got um fried legumes in there um garlic chips are in there. Uh, normally it's like, um, almost like a slaw mix with, um, tomato and cabbage in there. So you mix it all up. It's, it's, and squeeze some lime on top. It has this like tanginess, but you have like salty. It's just so good and fresh. And then you Mm. pair with some rice. So I'm thinking, okay, this, this concept obviously is beautiful and delicious to me but as for someone who's never had it a when you hear the word fermented most Mm. people are already thinking like i don't know like that sounds (laughs) like it might be stinky it might Mm. you know it might make me feel sick i don't know just fermented Mm. but so unless you're a really curious eater then those are my people uh so (laughs) when it because um when you mix it all up it's not as beautiful as it could be but it's ugly delicious as Mm. most people (laughs) know that term Mm. so what i did was i did the mixture but i i went ahead and elevated the the cabbage i i smoked it uh it's purple cabbage instead of the normal i wanted to add color to it too so i I got purple cabbage and i did a puree with a little coconut because i i think coconut and the nuts and the beans there it's going to play well so i added actually a little element of coconut milk in there to make a really um um, smoky um, and beautiful and creamy um, cabbage puree. Um, and the rice, I did a sticky rice and put little black sesame seeds on top. You'll probably see a picture of it on my Instagram. It was like my very first one that I was like, this is it. This is my signature. Mm. And for for the um, tomatoes, instead of, um, you know, just slicing up and tossing it in there, I, I went ahead and stuffed the La Pet mixture with the nuts into the tomato after I blanched and peeled the skin off so there's less, less t- uh, toughness. Um, and then, of course, squeeze of lime on top. And when you squeeze lime juice on purple cabbage it turns into this beautiful like hot pink color it's like interactive too so Mm. it's you know to me it's just like it's literally like all the ingredients that's in la petto is there but you know now you when you squeeze the lime the color changes you know how it's presented is different um yeah so i guess that's kind of like like my main like baby right now that I've totally taken a little original take on and I'm continuing to do that with other ones such as uh, tofu though which is a, which is a chickpea tofu mm-hmm. salad but instead of you know mixing it all up I'm presenting it a little different I'm adding you know very light, fresh um, sliced cucumber, and we're putting the the um, tofu though in the middle to roll it up. But then I wanted to add spice, so I added like a um, it's a sriracha and lime um, pearls. That's like a caviar. So we're gonna mm. put that on top to add a little spice and the lime, which it traditionally already has. So it's just 
deliver differently, you know, and, and I want it to be like small and intricate and fun and it's vibrant in color and flavor, um, which it will still respect the original recipe. So those are, those are like the two, like, ideology that I have behind a mm. dole. Mm -hmm. I really want to prom promote creativity to it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned how uh, once you started serving Burmese food, even in the Carolinas, people in the small town there, people kind of come out of the woodwork with connections to Myanmar. And I find the same thing. I find it really curious mm -hmm. that sometimes you think of it as this like isolated, exotic, um, far away country that's not connected to anything else. And then when you go out and start talking about it, you find this person who does this meditation tradition and they know about it through that way, or this person whose uncle was in uh, the Burma front of World War II, or this person yes. who's always been fascinated by Lethwe or, or something else, or this person who was on the Thai border doing this or that. And once you start putting something out there, it's really incredible how connected it is. And don't even get me started on, on some of the little known facets <laughs> of history of all the, the, I'm the here historical. For it. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, just, just, just one of the things I was tripping on um, a few days ago is just, if you look at the, the so-called celebrities that were on the Burma front, I mean, just to name two, uh, I believe it was the grandfather of President Obama was an African soldier conscripted into the the British forces in World War II that fought in Burma, and what I and I I've uh, that's been talked about for some time since he became president. What I just found out uh, last week, which floored me, was that Steven Spielberg's father was also on the Burma front, and what? Steven Spielberg was shaped by stories of his father and as a child of his father and uh, fellow soldiers on the Burmese front rehashing like their, their their war stories and talking about the and you know the Burma front in World War II was just horrendous. I mean, as bad as uh -huh. World War II is, that was um that stood out as really the hell, even among a hell of World War II. And given the conditions there, you know, one of ten people, one of ten soldiers on the Burma front on either side died from the enemy. Nine of ten died mm -hmm. from the elements. I mean, that's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so Steven Spielberg, this, you know, this um who ends up being a storyteller of war stories and and um and war films and stuff like that he describes how in a fresh air interview i heard he describes how that came from that that desire to want to tell war stories and and engage in storytelling came from hearing um his father and colleagues describing their experiences on the burma front and so all these things just kind of pop oh. up when you when you when you put when you go out there and then i mean that's in a, in a big scale way just in a small scale yeah. way when you when you have a pop-up burmese shop or in my case when i've done different presentations or different um different events uh the wherever i am people come out of the woodwork in terms of like i did this or i have an interest in this or my family was like that so the question i had for you with that was um given that that Burmese food is not so well known, and and Myanmar itself is is always relegated to uh, to a very kind of simplistic, even reductionist story of of what the country and people are. And right now, the the times are as as bad as they've ever been, and the resilience is as high, and the solidarity is as high as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. With the work that you're doing and serving Burmese food and bringing Burmese food into your local community where you're living in the Carolinas, uh, how, to to what extent do you see the Burmese food acting as a representation for something more, something as the people, the culture of the country, even the democracy movement and the hopes of that. Uh, and to what degree do you see it as just food as food as something to enjoy? Well, I, you know, I think it starts, it sparks a curiosity, you know, um, it, I'm sure any other cuisine, I mean, we, we know a lot of the other cuisines pretty well because probably starting through food, you know, like Indian food, for example, the spices came over and we're like, oh, what's all this piques their interest. And now you can definitely get Indian food that's, you know, locally almost everywhere and which is wonderful or Mexican food and such. So and I think because people are familiar with the ingredients, the food, if something were to happen there, um, you know, politically or just anything, you, you you're like, can more connected to it you know you're like wait what's going on over there or what it is and you're you it's just it, you have that connection overall and it, it's it's more personal to you because not only you've enjoyed the food but you probably have actually met the 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 people from there and now it's becomes more of like a um like a like i said like a personal thing this is like if something's going on over there you're definitely more engaged and i think 
you know, number one thing is awareness, right? On if anything is happening, um, we need to know that like, not only that people know about it, but if it's such a commonality that every most people know about it, we can actually build together on movements and actions and get together to help um, with change or, you know, what whatever that crisis is. I think I think food is just an easy and common and very primitive way to just already peak interest from the start. I mean, we're human, we're, we're you know, food is energy, we're, we're already going to be like, oh, what is that? So I think it's such a, a sly and like, easy way to just already introduce people to invite them to be like, hey, come check this out, you know, instead of just being like, um, just saying things, it's, or, or just telling someone about it versus actually tasting it, right? You're you're more um, appealing to more of your um, senses when you're tasting it, smelling it, you're hearing about it now. Now you're like, okay, I'm connected to this story. Like, so I, I really think, um, you know, this is my little part in hoping that, um, you know, as things are, are uh, unfolding and such, I, I'm really hoping there's more connection that it can help build to, to, to my country <laughs> uh, mm. through food, definitely. Mm, great. Well, well, thanks for all that. It's been great checking in with uh, what you're doing with bringing Burmese food to the Carolinas and your uh, Instagram account and everything else will be linked to this episode. So everyone, anyone who <laughs> listen and passes through should definitely uh, check that out and hopefully have a, a brick and mortars place eventually they can find. If not, they, I'm sure your schedule will be on the, on the Instagram they can follow. Uh, before we close, is there anything else you'd like to mention that we haven't had a chance to share yet here? Um, just thank you so much, everyone, um, ever, all of your followers overall and, and the things you do too, Joa, like it's, it's, it's honestly such an honor to be here. And, um, if anybody is around in the Carolinas, <laughs> come on by, I would love to hear your stories too. And, you know, um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's share more and connect more and, um, thank you so, so much. <laughs> Many listeners know that in addition to running these podcast episodes, we also run a nonprofit, Better Burma, which carries out humanitarian projects across Myanmar. While we regularly post about current needs and proposals from groups on the ground, we also handle emergency requests, often in matters that are quite literally life or death. When those urgent requests come in, we have no time to conduct targeted fundraisers, as these funds are often needed within hours. So please consider helping us to maintain this emergency fund. We want to stress that literally any amount you can give allows us to respond more flexibly and effectively when disaster strikes. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, internally displaced person IDP camps, food for impoverished communities, military defection campaigns, undercover journalists, refugee camps, monasteries and nunneries, education initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A.org. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. 
We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. Oh, ba, yaranan, da, da, yaranan, 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 da,